Hi everybody, this is Al Spath on Positive Poker Insiders. Today we got a special guest. We got that young pro, Noah Schwartz. Young, I should say. He's 32 years old now, so let's bring Noah on in here. Hi Noah, how are you? Hey Al, great to be on, man. Thanks for having me. Noah's coming from Miami, his hometown of Miami, down there in sunny Miami, Florida. And uh, Noah was just telling me a little bit about uh, playing a, a small event yesterday. He hadn't played such a small event. He fired a few bullets, but uh, he's looking forward to the upcoming events this, uh, this next couple of weeks. It'll be a little higher entry. Noah, let's, let's start out by telling them about your baseball career. I understand that you were a pretty good pitcher. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I want to remain humble, but I, I was pretty good. You know, it, it, it was really beneficial that I was lefty. Um, you know, I started playing when I was, you know, five years old. My dad put me in like T-ball league and, you know, at five years old, they had me playing like the seven, the seven year old. So, uh, I remember that the, 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 the guy who ran the organization, it was called the PAL, which is the police athletic league. His name was Charlie Newen. And he always said, Hey, this guy's going to be a talented one. And, uh, you know, working my way up, you know, I, I played uh, uh, basically, you know, on the highest levels uh, for the Optimist Leagues, traveled all around the United States, almost made it to the Little League World Series, then went, played high school ball, um, played two, year, two years of JV and two years of varsity, um, and then went to FIU, but, you know, my senior year in high, in high school, I started getting these elbow pains and stuff, and I was like, you know, I got to fight through this, you know, maybe my arms just sore from throwing a lot of innings. Um, and then it turned out uh, when um, ball started my freshman year, I, I had an MRI done, and I actually had it's, it's a condition called medial epicondylitis, and basically it's you know all my ligaments were torn because I started throwing curveballs at a really young age, and essentially it just it just wore on my arm, and a lot, it happens to a lot of pitchers. Uh, and then I and believe it or not, that was the time I just started playing poker, so it was like. Do I have Tommy John surgery and pursue baseball? And I was kind of, I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean, I was like, I really love poker, and I was, you know, it was, it was my competitive uh, edge. You know, I, I'm, I'm a very competitive person. So when I was able to, uh, when I found poker, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm just going to give up on baseball. <laughs> was that 2000? Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This was well, 2000. It was really uh, the the summer of 2001. So it was just after your dad passed. Right, exactly. My dad had just passed. I mean, I was just, I started playing like a small home game with a bunch of friends. Um, I, you know, I was 18 years old at the time, so I was playing a little bit online. Uh, my uncle had set up a credit card for me, which I actually had used to play online. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was sort of the gist of it, what, what happened. And I just decided that, you know, I'm going to focus on my studies and poker, and, and that's what I did. Yeah, I, I read that you used poker as a distraction because you know it was very it was a big loss for you. I know how close I read how close you were to your dad and and him dying. Uh, I think you were 17 at the time and uh, or, or maybe 18, and then you went to the Florida International for finance. I believe you got your degree in finance. Yeah, that that is correct. All, all that information is is spot on. Do you think that it was the baseball or your father or a combination of both that gives you the confidence that you have at poker. I really think that I was thinking, where did that come from? You, you, know, you know, to be quite honest, I'm not really sure exactly where it stems from, but it were a lot of things. Even like growing up when I played video games, like I would play like Madden football and I would learn like every defense, you know, that I had to set up based on the sure. offensive formation so I could get to the quarterback in two seconds, but you know, if they have four wide receivers, so on and so forth. So I was, it was, there was always a lot of theory and me implementing like different tactics to be the best at whatever I did, even mega, I mean, it, it was just, just everything that I put my mind to, I just really, I went full throttle and I just, I said, you know what, I'm going after it. And it was sort of my, my, my love for the game of poker. When I started playing, I was like, you know, I love the competitive aspect of it. I love, you know, trying to paint a picture in other people's eyes, and I didn't really have a good understanding of the game for sure. I remember the first tournament I ever won. I mean, I luck boxed my my way into it. Where the like, 162 is that the 162? Yeah, on poker start. I'm po on on party poker. Yeah. That was for like 40k, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and then you know, I, and I remember like I raised under the gun king ten of diamonds, and then a guy like moved in for half my stack, and I was like, oh, I have a good hand, king ten suited. You know, I yeah. called. He had two aces, and it came ten ten flop, and I was like. Oh, it's <laughs> This is an easy game, you know? <laughs> sick, sick. <laughs> Such a simple game. And then the final hand, we were heads up, and I had like 7-8, and it was like a limp pot, and it came 4-5-6. Oh, wow. Yeah, and the guy had deuce 3. Like It was like, all right, here you go. Like, 
I, I ran unbelievably well, but I, I, I thought I understood what was going on, but I was completely clueless at the end of the day. But, so what uh, happened to that 40,000? How fast did you blow that? I, I, I lit it on fire as quickly as someone can light up a cigarette, you know? <laughs> Was it because you were playing um, reckless, or you think you were playing yeah. just too many high buy-in games at the same? Uh, I think it was a myriad of things, but I think that I really didn't understand. Well, I, I didn't. Not that I think I know that I didn't understand bankroll management the least bit. You know, I went. I was playing twenty-five fifty, like buy-in five k. You know, and I I basically had you know forty-two thousand to my name. You know, two thousand in my bank account and forty thousand on party poker. So uh, it was just being a gambler. You know. So, uh, you know, we, we live and learn. If, if you don't learn from your mistakes in life, then uh, you, you've got problems. So then back in 2007, you hit it pretty big again, didn't you? At the yeah, that, Stars Million. Yeah, that, that was actually, that was my break that I got in life. And I was just sort of getting by. I had financial aid and I had some, I had some scholarship money and I was using that. And I was putting it towards poker, but... Um, the story goes like this. So I was basically, I had a, one of my best friends, Austin Weiss, uh, his family is very like influential. He said, he invited me to his wedding and I said, of course I'll be there. You know, this is a, this is on a, a weekend in North Florida. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So yeah, I called his friend up of mine, this girl, and I said, hey, you want to call me to his wedding? She's like, sure, let's go. And at the time I wasn't doing well financially. I literally rented a car and uh, went up to this wedding and this was Friday. So we enjoyed the wedding Friday and Saturday. Sunday morning, I woke up and she's like, let's go to the beach. And I'm like, no, 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 I have to go home to play this tournament. It's like a two and a half hour drive. And she's like, are you crazy? I'm like, no, well, listen, it, it, it's, 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 my, it's my way or this is how it's happening. You, you can stay up here and go to the beach by yourself, but, uh, you know, I have to play this tournament. She's like, all right, whatever. She got, she gave me like a hissy fit. I mean, this is just like a friend of mine. And mm -hmm. uh, I went, went to Western Union, deposited, I, I literally deposited $2,000 for the day and uh, played this Sunday Million, and uh, it, it was crazy. I mean, you know, started at 4 p.m., was 1,800 people. At the time, I think it was the biggest Sunday Million ever. Uh, it was like 380,000 for first place. It was, they used to do it every quarter, which they don't do anymore, but um, long story short, so with like 20-something people left, I was like fourth in chips, and this hand came up where a guy opened 50,000. I had two queens, I re-raised them, then the big blind who had me covered went all in for like a million and I thought forever and I ended up folding and I think they know that I had a big hand but they thought that I was like playing scared that was kind of the impression I had uh -huh. and then like five hands later I opened like ace queen of spades and the cutoff guy in the big blind went all in for 780 I had like 1.1 million I'm like I'm not I'm not letting it go this time I called the guy at jack 10 uh -huh. he's he spiked the jack he beat me and now I was like my, my brain was just like I was like uh -huh. you know Ultimate tilt. <laughs> wow. I said, why does this always have to happen to me? You know, like the biggest spot of my life. So um, far, so far. Yeah, at that point, of <laughs> course. You know, I mean, this is like, I mean, I'm playing for almost $400,000 and there's like 20 something people left. So I have a legit shot. Yeah. Long story short, a few hands later, guy opens. I have ace jack suited. I move in. He has ace king. I hit a jack. I doubled up. And then, um, you know, I got to the final table and I just saw people. I was like eighth in chips and people just started knocking each other out. And I just looked. Kept looking at the pay scale and moving up and moving up and moving up. I'm like, wow, this is real money. And before you knew it, th first place and second place get into a hand. I have like 10, 10 12 big blinds. They get all in. Mm -hmm. It was like a jack. It was a queen, 10, 5, all club flop. I don't want to bore everyone with uh, No, no, no. It's fine that you can remember that stuff. Yeah, cool. yeah. It was queen, 10, 5, all clubs. It was raised pre-flop. And one guy had three queens and the other guy had king, 9 of clubs. And Ooh. they got all in and the, and the flush held. And now I went from, you know, now I was guaranteed like 163,000. And at the time, the guy's like, you want to do a chip chop? And I'm like, I mean, I look at the numbers. I, I didn't really understand ICM all that well and stuff. Yeah. And then we looked at it and I would have got like an extra 9K. And I'm like, let's play, you know. And he had 16 million and I had 4 million. Right. You know, so he had me 4 to 1. And I was like, let's just play, you know, 160. I'm happy. Worst comes to worst. Yeah. You know, literally the first hand, we're playing 100, 200,000. And I get ace 10 of clubs and we get all in and he has ace 5. And I, I double. Now I have 8 million, he has 12 million. The very next hand, I have 3, 4 hearts. The flop comes with 2 hearts. He like bets, I call. Then the turn is a 3, the river is a 4. <laughs> so I'm in like a sizable pot. So now we're, we're almost like dead even, literally in two hands. Uh -huh. And uh, he says, chip chop. And I said, all right, well, let's look at the numbers. So then it came out like 310,000, 310,000, and we play for 50. Now I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, 
like the first hand back or second hand back, I get two jacks. I'm like what? What's going on here? This is like rigged for me for sure. <laughs> and 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 we get all in. He has ace ten, and the flop comes jack nine nine. And literally, he went from four to one to over in like fifteen minutes. It was or twelve minutes. It was the most unbelievable run of cards and like situations. I ran so unbelievably well, and it was like, and I just stared at the at my poker stars balance for about six hours because I was in complete awe. I couldn't believe like. How is you know? How did this happen to me? You know, like how did I get so lucky? And, and how about those folks that said, "What are you crazy going to play? What did you do when you got on the cell phone and you told them that what you did and how you made out?" What they say then? No, I mean no, and then people were like, "Card Player Magazine was calling me because like my moniker was for you haters," and they're like, you know, and they started asking me all these cool questions, and I was like, "Wow, you know, this is like a this is a big step in my career, like for me to get lucky like this, you know, maybe maybe I would have went." Another five years and went unnoticed and worked in finance or, or who knows, you know, like in life you need, you, need, you need that opportunity, you know, sometimes opportunity knocks and we forget to open the door, but when it does knock, you got to make sure you uh, take full advantage of it. And uh, I just went and I was like, you know what, I'm going to play the tour. Like I'm cashing out 250 and I'm going to go play. Cool. Uh, yeah. That was the start of it all. Wow. Um, by the way, uh, one of our uh, listeners, the Dark Hammer, her name is uh, Two Isles. She's Carrie, she lives up in Vegas, and she says, not boring at all. She loves it, the fact that you can remember the hands and the cards and things. You know, poker players are like that. Golfers are like that, too. You know, you remember that shot. You remember that, that, that six iron that you hit into the woods and you had an even shot. You know, the, the, the ironic thing is a lot of times the brain, the way it functions, we remember a lot of the bad, but we don't really remember so much of the good or when we put that bad beat on someone or whatever it is. We, we place so much emphasis on getting unlucky in a spot and, oh, man, the guy hit a gut shot, but... You know, I try to focus on the positives in life because too much, too many times everyone's so focused on the negative things. You got, you got to clear that from the mind. You know? Well, if you notice that our stream name is uh, Positive Poker Insiders, you notice that that's all we talk about is being positive, talking. We don't want to talk about the hands and the bad beats of the past. We want to look at the future. We want to learn from the past, but we don't want to dwell on it because that's negative energy. That's going to just take something right out of us that we don't need. We don't need to be brought down. We need to be lifted up. Absolutely, I couldn't. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, that's that's kind of the important thing, and that's why I try to place emphasis on doing nice things for people and giving people like hope. You know, we all need it. Sure. When I when I talk to people or when I train people or coach people, I tell them that you know we got some goals set up, like in a tournament. We first off, we want to, we want to play our best. We want to capitalize on other people's mistakes, and we want to reduce the mistakes that we made. Then we want to get ourselves in a position to win and get into the money. And then once we get into the money, we want to either ladder climb or you know, take some people on or let some other people do some damage for us. We don't have to be the sheriff at the table. But you want to go for those lofty goals, but you have to you have to go on milestones. you got to be positive about the way you play. And you can't approach going to a casino some night and say, well, I'm going to enter that $500 tournament. I got uh, I got 500 to lose. That's a negative attitude. I got $500 to lose. That's You should go in there, hey, I'm, I'm shooting for the stars here. And if I, if I fall short, I'm still going to be a winner. And exactly. Shoot for the moon, and if you don't hit the moon, you'll be stuck in the stars, which isn't a bad place to be, right? That's not a bad place. I read somewhere that you were either getting into or maybe established a nonprofit. Did you do yeah. that? Uh, it, 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 it's been in the works for quite some time, and you know, I've sort of been a little bit stuck in uh, quicksand, to be honest with you. I've been focusing, I've been doing a lot of uh, charity work for other charities, for the after school all stars in South Florida. Or make a wish. I just hosted an art auction for the uh, for the Ronald McDonald kids of South Florida. So nice. you know, I'm I'm trying to put together a good team and uh, launch my foundation. And and it's really one of the things that uh, hopefully in the next six to eight months I will get up and running. And uh, I'm really excited about that. The premise, the cause. I, I mean, originally I had a lot of ideas and I was going to do it for uh, cancer research, but I just don't think there's an immediate, um, you don't just see an immediate uh, impact, you know, there's a lot going on, a lot of people donating a lot of money, but, you know, I want to see like, uh, you know, like Make-A-Wish does and, 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 you know, help people that you, you can see an immediate impact for. So I'm really excited about that, you know, considering where I came from and stuff, it's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a long time goal of mine, so. Well, let's talk about that. Where did you come from? How about those years between 1 and 17? Where did you tell us a little bit about that background? Um, yeah, I mean, growing up, I mean, I was born and raised in Miami Beach, um, you know, mostly with my father. My mother, you know, was 
dating somebody else at the time, so they were divorced. So spent a lot of time with my dad and my brother. You know, we were we had a, we formed a tight uh, bond. You know, a nice family, just all the boys. You know, mm-hmm. no no women to to drive us crazy at the time. But you know, it's it's kind of important to have that uh, that role of a woman. But unfortunately for me, I didn't. So I had to, um, you know, go with what I knew in life. Um, so. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of tough times. My father was like an old school New Yorker. I mean, grew up, you know, hung out with a lot of like uh, a lot, a lot of uh, how, how do we say this? A lot of well connected people, I would say. And um, you know, he sort of was tough on my brother and I, but gave us tremendous love. You know, taught us the values of life, what was important. You know, how to treat a woman, things of that nature, and. Uh, you know, unfortunately for me, my father loved to smoke cigarettes, mm-hmm. which I always told him growing up, Dad, you know, stop smoking. It's not good for you. And he, he said, don't worry, I'll be okay. But, uh, yeah, so when I was about 15, he got diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. And uh, so that was a really tough time in my life, you know. And uh, basically the cancer metastasized. And, you know, I, I saw him go from a, you know, he used to play football in college. He went from a 6'2", 230-pound guy to to real frail and brittle from chemotherapy and stuff. It, it was hard to watch and he constantly told us he was going to be okay but at the end of the day it was just, you know, it's hard. How do you tell your kids, like, hey, listen, this is this is going to be the end. Who was uh, his first name? Robert Schwartz. Robert Schwartz. My grandfather's name was Ira Schwartz. My mother's maiden name is Catherine Schwartz. So yeah, we, have, I, we have Ira Schwartz in the family also. From, from New York. We're yeah. from New York City and I, my grandfather was a fireman there back in the day. So... So connected somewhere in lineage, somewhere yeah, up here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but you know, life, life presents you with a ton of hurdles. You know, and, and it's it's how you handle them. You know, I could have easily, I was hanging out with the wrong people. You know, I was smoking weed at a young age, and I was I was definitely not headed down the right path in life. You know, I, I faced a lot of adversity, but you know, when I lost my father, and not a lot of people know this, I basically went out and wrote like a twenty-page letter. You know, the night that, he, that I got the call that he passed away, and I, I just said, you know, everything I do in my life, I'm going to dedicate to him. Well, maybe that foundation, maybe that nonprofit can include his name in there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I was thinking about having like a Robert Schwartz College, like scholarship fund and things like that, even if it's like a branch of what the charity does, um, just to sort of salute the type of man that he was at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that was, you know, there was a lot, you know, we, we, we were definitely, uh, we didn't have a lot of money growing up and we moved a lot, you know, we, we got evicted from some places and, and, you know, I look back and I was ashamed back then, but you know what, it, it made me who I am today and that's why I, when I, when I see people, I don't judge them based on where they come from or what they do and I'll tell you a quick story which is, which is one, of the, one, one, of, one of the stories that makes me really happy in life. We love stories, go ahead. Yeah, stories are good, so last year at the WSOP I was, uh, I just walked into the bathroom and I was washing my hands and me being the person I am, there was a guy mopping the floor and cleaning the bathroom, African, African-American guy and I said, hey, I said, hey buddy, how's your day going? He was like, he's like, you know, he goes, man, he goes, I'm so thankful and I'm so happy and I looked at this guy, I'm like, man, what a positive attitude. I said, why? He said, man, I just spent 14, more than 14 years in prison and I just got out and I got a job and I'm, and, and I'm so happy. You know, I can't believe it. And I said, look at this guy. You know, all of us, we sit and we complain because, oh. uh, you know, the flight's late or our coffee's not hot enough or we're, whatever the situation may be. And I said, I said, I said, man, that's a great attitude. I went in my pocket. I gave the guy 500 bucks. I said, hey, here. I said, it's not that much, but I said, this is for you. The guy looks at it. He goes, man, he goes, you restored my faith in God. And he started hugging me and shit. And I was oh, starting my French. And I was like. And I was like, man, I go, don't worry about it. I said, just pass it forward. I said, just stay positive, man. Life has a lot to offer, you know, focus on the positive things. And he, the guy, I mean, literally saw tears in his eyes. And to me, that was like, that was a really nice moment for me because, yeah, 500, you know, it's not, not going to mean much to me. And uh, for him, it was like, I, I made this guy's whole month probably, you know. I know. I wish more people would pay it forward. I, I, I told a story a while back. I was in a, a ShopRite, which is a local store here, and the lady in front of me, had all these groceries and everything. It came up to like, I don't know, $139 or something like that. And she said, I only have the stamps for X amount. And the lady started taking off things and everything. I said, well, the lady was going to bring them back. I said, just put them over on the side. When she got all done, she rung up the order. And I said, now put all those things on my tab. It wasn't much, but I just put them on my tab. And the lady looked at me. It was, it was like I gave her a million dollars. 
and I'm in a position to do it, and it was uh, nothing. But I wish more people out there would do those kind of things. If they're in a position to do it, just do it. You know what I mean? Just, there's no fanfare. Just just do it. Make somebody's life. I I was at the ba- I was at I used to work for Major League Baseball uh, Productions. We used to do Baseball Max, and this week in baseball. And I'm on the field at Fenway Park in a 99 uh, All-Star game where all the 100 top players are there. And they gave out all these different kind of uh, uh, prizes and, and gifts for all the, the, the athletes. And, and we got them, too. And I had this one black ball that said the All-Star game and had a clock in it and everything. And I had it in my pocket. And I walked out to the Fenway uh, foul pole, which is called the Pesky Pole, where Johnny Pesky hit this home run. It's a real short part of the park. And there was a little kid there and his mother... And the kid's trying to get the ball in batting practice that are on the field. He can't even reach down. So I, I, I look at him and I watch him. I'm, I'm just watching what's going on. All these big kids are taking advantage of the situation. So I walk over and I said, this is the special ball by that was commissioned by the commissioner for the baseball players. And I said, you got to cherish this the rest of your life. And you got to be a baseball fan the rest of your life. I'm going to give this to you. And I gave it to him. His mother was bawling. The kid was happy. All these other kids were trying to take it away from him. I said... If anybody takes away from it, it was a, a guard. I said, arrest him. I said, just arrest him. And yeah. I mean, I think this kid will remember that the rest of his life. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. those moments, you know. And like you said, there's not a lot of people that I feel, you know, but you have to just focus on the positives and, and, and stay upright and just hope that, uh, you know, pe- people do the right thing. You know, that's all we, can, all we can hope for, right? One of your sayings is nothing's guaranteed. Very true. Nothing's guaranteed. Did that come really when the, the, when the loss of your dad? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's like, and, and there's this, and there's this concept. Uh, I read a lot of books, and there's this concept called uh, hedonic adaptation. And basically, and it not not it's I'm going out a little bit off on a tangent, but it just talks about in life. You know, a lot of times we we suffer a lot of heartache and pain, but um, you know, life is kind of crazy. You know, like if I said, hey, I'm going to give you a Lamborghini today, you know, you would be happy for a certain period of time, but essentially it, it'll wear off, and you. will and you'll basically revert back to this this level of like equilibrium, so to speak, or like you lose someone very important. Like, and it's true, time does heal things, but at the end, you'll never forget it, and, and you miss you miss him immensely. You know, I think about him all the time, and I wish that he could see the things that I'm doing. And if he is watching, I'm you know, sure. who knows, right? I'm sure. I, he I, is. Hope, I hope you know when we close our eyes and it's all said and done, we go to a place and. You know, maybe it's better than where we're at now, you know, but we, we don't know, right? So That's right. We don't know. Well, do you think he's smiling when he sees Schwartzy Baby on your Twitter handle? Yeah, you know, I mean, wh- where I've come from and stuff, I mean, anyone who grew up with me, they, they, they know the type of person I am. And I think my father would just be, I mean, he would just be so happy. And, and, and he always said, you know, I mean, I always did great in school. And he always said, he said, you know, you're the chosen one, kid. You know, make sure you uh, you, you live up to those expectations. And, and it's hard with the things that I faced, you know, a lot of people can't get out of that. And I was, I've been very, very fortunate and very, very lucky to be able to, um, to be able to get to where I'm at, especially playing poker. It's very, very difficult. And I've really, um, depended on poker for quite some time. And, and, you know, I don't know the numbers, but I know it's got to be less than 5% that can truly make a real, real living out of playing poker professionally. I mean, it's very, very difficult year in and year out. 2%. Two percent. Okay, two percent. Well, closer to two percent. That's a, but listen, out of millions and millions of people, two percent of millions and millions of people is, is, is a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, yeah. listen. Uh, I I inspire and I tell people, you know, go for it. You know, people send me messages all the time on Facebook and they're grinders. And you know, in fact, I'm going to be running a contest really soon for the World Series of Poker as soon as my website gets done. Uh, and uh, so I'm excited about that. Where I'm basically going to give someone an opportunity to come on a private jet with me. Wow. Um, to to the World Series of Poker, uh, you know, hang out with me, go to dinner with me, and then I'm gonna put them in some type of event. But I just I have to run t- some sort of uh, contest because one, I want to help build my brand. You know, I haven't really been placing a lot of emphasis on it, and lately, a lot of people have been reaching out to me and say, you know, you're very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, you know, I'm I'm very. Uh, uh, that I'm drawing a blank, but nonetheless, anyway, go ahead, like, I'm, go ahead. I'm very open. You know, and, and I, I always take time out to answer people's questions. I'm not like... Accessible. You know, I, I, You're accessible. Yeah, accessible. A lot of people would be like, you know, I don't have time for this. But, you know, listen, I do get some weird questions at the end of the day, which I may not may or may not answer. But, uh, you know, I, I, wanna, I want people to, you know, try to play poker professionally and not, 
you know, they can do it. You know, if, if you have the mindset and you're willing to put in the work and perseverance, you know, it's possible. You know, the game's changed a lot, but uh, there are a lot of avenues to make money. Well, any of us over at Positive Poker Insights can do anything to help you out in that venture. You know, just call on us. We'll, we'll lend a hand. Anything we can get the word out, social media, anything when your website's up, just give me the, the nod. I'm on many, many forums on social media and poker players. I'll get the word out for you. No problem at all. I'll do a video and get it out there, and then you can, you know, share it with a whole bunch of people on your side, too. So, yeah, we're here to hand, stand by you. We like your kind of attitude in the game, and we're here to support that. Really appreciate it. I got a question here from Carrie. She wants to know where do you keep the bracelet that you won at the 2013 World Series of Poker Europe, Mix, uh, Max PLO, and can she see it? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna go outside of my office. And show okay. You something. Go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you a little the little shrine that I have here. All right. We like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's there's the Alpha A trophy. Yeah. There's the bracelet. There's the WPT trophy. Nice. Yeah, then they gave me a little, you can't see it, and there's a custom painting I had commissioned. Uh, four, my six. favorite. I won the four six of diamonds, which I won my biggest hand ever in uh, in a cash game with. So they call that the Schwartzy. So whenever you get the four six of diamonds, I'm going to go back in my room, my little cubby hole. I'll have to say that on some of my streams. I'll have to remind people of that when I get that and, and stuff like that. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, um, the bracelet yeah. itself, when you, when you won it, I know you won the money, yeah. But how thrilled were you about the bracelet compared to the money? Wasn't that yeah. the thing? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you a quick backdrop to the story. So that year, I had made a bunch of bracelet bets that I would win two bracelets in one year, and the odds were really in my favor. And um, it was kind of demoralizing because I played a fifteen hundred PLO, and I, I thought I was going to play many more tournaments, but. I got sidetracked, the cash games were good, so I really didn't devote myself to the bet. I sort of wrote it off. So I played this 1500 PLO, and I ended up getting in second, and I, I went heads up with this guy, and I had him like seven to one, and he was, he, the look on his face was so dejected, and he kept telling me, let's get this over with, and I got so confident, and it really, I, I really look, reflect back, and I made a few critical mistakes in that tournament, in which I usually don't make, and um, that was sort of the most gut-wrenching loss of my career or tournament. Or I mean, that moment, I, I went back to my room and I was, really, uh, I was really depressed because I was so close and I could taste it. And I saw the bracelet and I saw everything. And I like to think that PLO is my best game and uh, I, I really just dropped the ball, you know. It's like Virginia being up 15 against Syracuse with eight minutes left and blowing the game. It was like, yeah, yeah I mean, that's like my analogy. I, I was probably up 30 you know, with six minutes left. And it's PLO, you know, you can keep the pot small and you, you know, I, I should never have lost that. And anyway, so then I went to Europe and uh, I played this mixed max hold'em and I got fourth place and I was pretty much, I got really unlucky. I got in pocket eights against ace five and I lost, whatever. And then I played the PLO and then that was the next event and then I won that event. So it was a little bit of redemption because I felt a weight lifted off my shoulders. Um, because I had been close before, and obviously that, that's what poker players strive for, is to, to, to win a gold bracelet or multiple gold bracelets. And, uh, you know, if I would have closed out the other one, obviously everything may have been different. I might not even have won that event, but if I would have won that one, I would have won a lot of money because I would have won two bracelets in the same year. Um, but it didn't transpire the way I wanted. But, you know, it, it was a nice redemption. You know, it was it was important for me. Well, our followers are going to predict at least two bracelets for you. I know it's a difficult task, but we're going to put you on the spot. And we're going to go for two during the June run out at, out in Vegas. Uh, like, uh, but tell, like, tell some of the, the, the people that are listening in today that well, might listen to this up on YouTube, on Al's Bath, on my on channel up there, or might just be looking at Facebook or, or Twitter. Tell them what a Mix Max PLO is. Yeah, it's actually a relatively new concept. So when they say mix max, they're doing hold'em and PLO now, and I think they're going to incorporate like a, a hold'em and PLO mix max. But essentially, the way it works is, the first day, if I'm not mistaken, you play eight-handed or nine-handed. Uh, then the second day, you play six-handed. Then the third day, you play four-handed, and then you play then you play heads-up matches. Wow. Yeah. So so you have to make big adjustments. Hand starting selections change immensely. Um, so you just gotta keep you 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 gotta be up to date on what's going on, you know, because 
it, you know, it's an ever changing game, and and you know, and and if you're not up to date on it, it's, it's definitely going to pass you by. But it's a it's a really really fun concept. It's a really really fun concept. Well, that's good. We got another comment here in the in the chat, and it says, "Wow, Noah, you're really down to earth, guy. I expected this big ego being a big star, but you're you're." And it's a totally agree from. Uh, somebody else they really like you know the way you come across so that that's props to you and your dad's influence on you and your brother yeah I greatly appreciate it. you know and sometimes some people see my social media stuff and they'll see me like posting about me being on a private jet but at the end of the day I'm trying to inspire people to show people that you know if I did it you can do it you know you just a lot of people are like oh you know I'm just trying to show off that I have money and all that you know it's it's easy to judge a book by its cover when the, the words can be misconveyed any which way. You know, people can say, "Oh, you know, he's a, he's a flashy showboat," but in fact, you know, if they, if they read deeper into the lines, they'll see that I'm just saying, "Hey, listen, you know, chase your dreams." You know, and and if and if your dreams aren't big enough, then you know you're not really dreaming. Like, think about it and, and go for it, because we live once, as far as we know, unless we get reincarnated and we turn into a butterfly or a doormat or whatever it is. But listen, po poker and, chip. Yeah, or poker chip. Yeah, exactly. Those are the things in the world, right? <laughs> um, but nonetheless, you know, I, I tell people, you know, and like yesterday, I, I went to play this tournament at the Hard Rock, and I haven't played a 350 buy-in in probably 10 years. And I had a couple friends there, and they're like, just come shoot this, just come shoot this shit with us, pardon my French. And I was like, all right, I'll come over. And I played with people, and, and these people, you know, I'm used to playing such big buy-ins where everyone's like, oh, Noah Schwartz, whatever. But these people were like, so happy to play with me and they couldn't believe it like they were telling everyone like hey Noah Schwartz is at my table you know and people were coming up and like shaking my hand and a couple people said hey can you sign this card for me and I was like sure you know what I mean like and I haven't gotten that in a long time and I was like wow you know maybe you know when I play 10 25k 100k buy in you know everyone's very similar level or maybe their egos are too big but all these people were like you know big poker fans and it was amazing to see these people like come up to me and ask me for a picture and sign a card I was like wow that's that's, that's really cool so I felt kind of special for a few minutes. That's nice. How about when, uh, when you were on that WPT? What, what was it like talking to, uh, did you get a chance to talk to Mike Sexton a little bit there and uh, how did he treat you? Yeah, well, well, well Mike uh, Mike and I have been friends for quite some time and he says that I'm extremely entertaining so they, they really like when I make final tables. I just made a deep run in the Bay 101 and I came I busted 13th and he told me after I busted and him and Matt, they were like, you know, we're really disappointed that you didn't make it because you make for good TV. So, uh, I was really disappointed too because it's a lot of money at stake and it was a good chance to, to 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 win my second WPT, which would have been which would have been pretty amazing. But life goes on, I guess. It goes on. Listen, Mark Curry, the odds and outs on uh, on Twitch. Uh, he sent in a couple of questions. The first, and I'm not going to give you this first one because he said, "What was it like in that other event before the uh, 2013?" He was asking exactly what you said about that other event, you know, prior to it, you know, coming in close and everything but then he has this this hand we talked about this before we came on stream yeah. uh, late late in the WSOP you finished second and, and to the bracelet in Vegas I believe it was and yeah. this is 20 hands before the end a monster pot where you open for 150 can you can you really leave that that hand with us yeah I, I mean and, and I think you, as you before mentioned so many hand where I had like jack 10 10 deuce I think with a suit or something I think is the hand the flop came with a jack 10 uh, two uh, two clubs, the ten and the two, and uh, he can't find anything. The pot must have been about four hundred thousand. He says, he said, uh, spot where your opponent might have two pair. You bet two hundred thousand. You want to know why you only bet the two hundred thousand? And your opponent calls, and the pot's seven hundred thousand. He said, the, uh, a, a turn was an eight of diamonds. Yeah, I remember, I remember. And then he he led pot, and then I called, and then the river was a club, and he checked, and I seven blocked. of clubs. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So so my thinking was, well. First of all, I mean, when you flop a set in that spot, I mean, it's it's a very it's a very dry, heavy board. You know, there's a lot of hands he can have, but nonetheless, I mean, he I don't remember. I think he had maybe had like two million. So a lot of times, I, I I'm betting my sizing is a lot. Like I'm just not betting full pot with my, with my bluff hands and my and my made hands. So I'm just keeping my sizing, um, you know, very arbitrary. So that's why I was just pretty much betting. You know, I I was constantly betting half pot. Um, in spots right. like that because you know a lot of times when I'm betting half pot and taking it down you know I don't I don't have to risk many chips but obviously I have a set here I'm trying to get in but nonetheless I was just I mean my sizing was just sort of based on uh, yeah, just just the way that I always play 
Um, did that hurt? Did, did you get a little? I know you said the word depressed earlier, but I think it's more, in my opinion, you get a little dejected that you didn't finish it off and everything. Did did that one sting any worse than any other ones, or, or was it you, you felt that you had that one in a bag, kind of? Well, that particular tournament? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was chip leader from like day two all the way. I mean, I went to the final table with like 60% of the chips. I raised basically every single hand because I knew they were just trying to move up. I mean, there were some hands I wasn't even looking at my cards because I knew that they were never going to three bet me, even if they had aces, because they knew that the, the jumps were so significant. that and, and there were a lot of short stacks that, you know, they don't want to just put it in with like 55% equity because in Omaha, you, you're never really crushing someone so bad. I mean, that's the thing. You know, like in, in No Limit, you know, if I have two two queens and you have six, seven, I mean, you're dead. But, you know, if you have the ace, deuce, seven, nine, and someone has king, jack, five, three, I mean, it's a, it's bingo, you know, or ace, ace, seven, eight against king, jack, deuce, four. I mean, you're not a huge favorite. You know, that's a, that's yeah, a, it seemed like you were in cruise control that whole day, and it, yeah, several, that whole week. But listen, uh, what, why, what drew you to PLO in the first place? I mean, most people, you know, I, I know that these... Other bracelets and the offsuits, I'll call them the offsuits because no limit is the, the mainstay there. Yeah. But the, I think you have better chances at some of these uh, other events like horse and, and stud and things like that. But what drew you specifically to PLO? Um, you, you know, uh, right right around the time that I won the, the Sunday Million, I uh, got introduced to PLO. This is 2003, 2004, whatever the year was, 2005. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like the... I'll tell you, after I won the Sunday Million, I'll tell you a funny hand. So I played like this pot where I flopped top set against this guy Chufty. And like, it came like nine, 10, 9, 4, and I had like ace, 10, 10, whatever. And then the turn came 7, river, nothing. And the pot went to him. And I was like, how, how did, it was like a $40,000 pot. I'm like, how did he win the pot? And the, 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 I just literally jumped straight into like 5,100 PLO because <laughs> um, my friend was like, dude, it's a great game. And then I, then I started studying a little bit. I mean, I've never really read a poker book or anything like that. Um, Who did you study? Who did you study? You know, to be honest, I, I, I a lot of it is myself. You know, I learned I learned just playing a multitude of hands and understanding. And then as I started traveling more, I started like talking poker and strategy. And then it all started making sense. And then I started sort of implementing my own approach to the game. Um, and I just thought, you know, and now obviously the resources are so abundant now. There's so many, so many sites, so many things. But when I was when I started playing, it it, it wasn't easily accessible so now it's like if you're not good there's a reason because there's, there's so many opportunities to learn and talk to people that are have great minds in poker that understand the game on a completely different level not, not just oh I have I have seven five I have to fold you know it's it's not there's so much more to it you know sure um, and in a couple of weeks I'm gonna have Rolf Slotboom on he used to work over at uh poker school online when i was a dean there and he also has authored many books on plo and he's over in uh, i believe sweden right now he's not playing as much on the tour and the world series but he's been in the world series many times but ralph uh, he's going to come in and i think it's uh two weeks from today and he's going to talk plo so uh i'll send you a copy of that one too uh, yeah yeah i mean i, I mean so, i love talking plo also i mean it, it, it's such a strategic game i mean there, there's so many nuances and, and and variables that go into when you're playing the game i mean it's a uh, it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun and it's uh, and also i think it enables like you know when you're playing with recreational players if they're playing plo i feel like uh, recreational players have a better chance in plo because there's so many combinations and things that you know they're never really dead you know yeah, no, I understand totally, totally. When you're not playing poker and you're not playing baseball anymore, what sports are you following on a day-to-day basis? I know you're just watching the NCAA, the Final Four, and stuff like yeah. that, but is there a team that, I mean, you're in Miami, I'm sure you're a Heat fan and things like that. Yeah. But what, 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 what gets your juices flowing the most? What sports? Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I grew up, you know, all, all sports minus hockey for the most part. Um, you know, I'm an all-Miami type of guy, Hurricanes, Miami Hurricanes and everything, Miami Heat, you know, Miami Marlins, I mean, I'm, I'm a hometown guy, you know, I, I grew up before there were Marlins, you know, my father being from New York, we were we were Mets fans, but then when the Marlins came and I became a Marlin fan, but yeah, I mean, I, I love sports, you know, I love the competitive uh, aspect of it, and you know, I have a lot of friends that are in the league and stuff, so I follow them a lot, and uh, you know, it's fun, it's fun. Yeah, I, I remember, uh, well, back when 
Florida didn't even have a team. I guess in Back to the Future, they said Florida was going to win a world's championship. If you remember that, that was Michael J. Fox going out on a limb. I mean, Florida didn't even have a team at that time. And now they've won a couple of championships, and they've got a nucleus there, you know, with Stan, I mean, with some of these uh, pitchers and stuff like that. But they're the type of team that always goes for it in a one- to two-year period, and then if they don't make it or if they make it, then they break it all apart because they can't afford – you know they can't afford the players and then they just rebuild for draft picks weird you know because it, it is a small it's not even that it is a small market team but jeffrey luria the owner no one really it, it's just always heartbreak because you sign all these big contracts like you like you said and then for some reason they just start dumping people for for minor league for farm system prospects and it, and it just never ends but you know this year they have a pretty decent team you know opening days tomorrow i'm, I'm very i became over the years very close with gene carlos stan you know we we hang out a lot and stuff and uh, he's one of my better friends, and he's just a really, really good person. And uh, you know, I'm excited for him. You know, you know, like you said, they have a young nucleus, Jose Fernandez. You know, they they got some good pieces, so maybe he can finally be on a on a winning team, which is you know, nobody likes to lose. I mean, it's got to be frustrating. I know. I'm, I'm a pro, I like to predict things. And my buddy uh, Steve Fortunato, he he runs Fortune Limited out of New Jersey. He has Bernie Williams and and several other people signed. Um, and he used to represent uh, for Scott uh, Boros. He used to work with Alex a lot. Alex Rodriguez and still does, and he's his number one counsel. When, when Alex wants to know something, he goes to, to Steve Fortunato. And, and Steve and I predict things, and I picked the San Francisco to win the year before. I picked Kansas City to win last year and this year, and I told everybody that uh, the Cubs would make a run. This was before they made the trades and everything, just, yeah. just due to their general manager hire from Boston. I said, they're going to make a run last year, and this year is the Cubs' year to win it. And if they don't win it this year, it's the Diamondbacks. People are just not counting the Diamondbacks in. They got a big injury yesterday to one of their guys. But I'm looking for the Cubs to be in that world. Say, I'm a Yankee fan. I'm not a Met fan, but I root for the Mets. If the Mets are in there, yeah. I go way back in baseball. I, I, I know lots of you know, players because I work for Major League Baseball and, and, and we, I had that interaction. I know exactly how you feel with uh, Stanton and, and, and these guys are just great to be with and they understand, you know, so much more than just baseball. And it's just a, a good feel and a positive feel of being around these guys. Yeah, and I think you're right with the Cubs. You know, I like Theo Epstein and their nucleus and now they got Jason Hayward. I mean, they're, they're, they're a very, very uh, good squad. I think they played today, actually. Sure I think they open up tonight. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think Pittsburgh's playing the Cardinals, yeah, and the Wayne Mets, Wright, Mets are playing Kansas City. It's Seventy degrees in Kansas City. It's snowing in Pittsburgh. Oh wow! There was snow on the field this morning when they got up. Oh, before I let you go, and I really do appreciate this uh, this interview today. Let's talk about movies and TV. What 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 kind of movies do you do you get into? You know, to be honest, I'm not. I'm, I mean, I, I go, but. You know, I'm not really, I don't spend too much time in front of the TV. I'd rather read and stuff, but like shows and stuff, obviously, you know, I'm a GOT, excited for season six, Game of Thrones, uh -huh. um, Narcos, you know, I like those suspense, those uh, type of shows, or, or some type of mystery where I actually have to use my uh, my brain to try to process information and, and, and foreshadow and come up with some type of conclusion of what's going on. I, I like things with substance. I also like the new show Billions. Pretty cool show about. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah great yeah. show. Um, movies, you know, I, I'm old school. I like, you know, I like. Uh, I don't know. I don't. Feel, the, ask, feel the dreams. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, I love, like, I love, I love Inter Interstellar, one of my favorite movies of oh, all time. Really? Yeah. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's truly. It just talks about time, you know, and how time evaporates and just different dimensions, and it's it's a must watch. It, it, it's for three hours, but it, it goes so fast, and it's like... It's, well, you're from Miami. I know that you got... If you didn't watch it live, you got the, the Dexter DVDs and watched all of Dexter, didn't you? Oh, no, you know what? I've never... You know, oh, you got to see Dexter. Oh, my God. Seen never seen it. Oh, you got to see it, man. It's yeah. Miami Police Department, man. He's... You know what he is? He's, he's, he's in the crime lab and everything. He's the blood splatter guy, but he's... He's he's the killer. He's the one that's doing everything, but he's the guy. Now you ruined it for me. No, dude. no, no, no. It, no, I won't ruin it. it you, he, you know that right from the beginning. But it's so cool, man. It's like, I think, six or seven years of it. You should get that whole series, man. Well, I guess, I mean, when I have a little time, I guess when I'm flying, I may need to put it on the iPad or something. Oh, I think, I think you'll love it. Let me know how you think about it. But listen, we wish you the best of luck. In the World Series, we, we really thank you for your time today. If there's anything we can do when you get that nonprofit going or anything for the contest coming up that I can spread the word, glad to do it. You're a great guy, and I really appreciate the time.
Awesome. Th thanks for your time also. I enjoyed talking to you and it's much appreciated and I hope you enjoy uh, your, your casual Sunday. <laughs> okay. Take care, man. Thanks, All buddy. the best. Thanks, everybody. Positive Pokers Thanks, Insiders man. is going off the air, but please share this with all your friends. Thanks so much. Peace out.